go. Good morning. We're here at the beginning of something new for all of us. Uh, I want to begin with a word about class because my approach to class uh, and your part in it remains the same. Uh, we have good textbook. We have good handouts. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what's in the handouts. Uh, in some cases, I'll add to what's there. Uh, in all cases, I'll try to explain, put things in the uh, bigger picture. And as before, uh, it's your responsibility to take these two sources of information, class notes on the one hand and reading material on the other, and synthesize it into a good understanding of uh, uh, Western civilization. I want to begin with a look back at the last two uh, major events in the course before everything changed for us uh, over and above and beyond spring break. Uh, the last two big events were first uh, the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Uh, that happened, finished in the late 400s. Uh, that great event took us out of the first period in our history. It took us out of ancient classical times and brought us forward into a entirely new age, the second of the three ages that we divide our time into. Uh, the second great event uh, was the uh, rise of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, the church began to rise even as the empire began to fall, so we would say that the church began its rise in the 300s and it outlived uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, it, it simply outlived uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, the age that the, 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 the rise of the church put us in the second of our great historical periods, variously called the Middle Ages or medieval civilization, uh, never uh, the Dark Ages any longer. I talked earlier about that. And the title for the period that I like most uh, is the uh, Age of Faith. Uh, faith is a word that is lightly used uh, without oftentimes much thought being given to what it actually means in medieval times. Uh, by faith, uh, medieval uh, man believed uh, his, his faith was in the uh, ministry of Christ uh, as explained in the what we call the New Testament and carried on uh, by the uh, Roman Catholic uh, Church. Uh, faith then was the faith in the church as a means whereby a man could regain, <clears throat> could regain the grace of God and avoid the punishments uh, of, of sin. Uh, it's during the same time that the, uh, that the Roman Empire fell, uh, bringing civilization to its knees very nearly to extinction that the church was able to save civilization at the same time that it saved souls. Uh, in every society in the past, the great symbol of civilization has been light. Uh, at the very beginning, God said, let there be light. And light has always been used as a symbol of civilization. And we can say that in the medieval period, the church kept the light of civilization burning. Uh, that is a great historical debt that we owe to the Roman Catholic Church. You don't have to be Catholic uh, to recognize that uh, historic uh, fact. There is just no other way. Uh, civilization could have survived the barbarian invasions uh, without uh, the civilizing work of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. How did the church do it? Well, in our last class, we recounted uh, 13 ways, I believe, uh, in which the church uh, managed to uh, keep the light of civilization alive. And I want to go back over those uh, with you. Uh, this will get us off into the second part of the course, all on the, all on the same page. Uh, first, uh, the first way the church kept civilization alive uh, was by taking over from the Roman Empire all of what we would call uh, social services, or in the new context, we would call charity. Uh, the church was a charitable institution, uh, and it performed all the institutions that people had come to expect, all the services that people had come to expect uh, from the uh, Roman Empire, uh, now uh, long, long gone. Uh, all services 
except uh, for uh, defense. Uh, the church was pretty much as defenseless uh, in the barbarian uh, invasions as uh, every, everyone else uh, became. Uh, second, the church saved civilization by being canonical. And what I mean by that is that the church, unlike anything else at the time, had a book. Uh, and that book, of course, is the combination New Test Old Testament, uh, New Testament, uh, and uh, the translation of the Greek Old Testament uh, added to the Latin New Testament is done was done by Jerome, Saint Jerome, and it remains the uh, Bible, the only Bible, absolutely the only Bible in mass copies but the only Bible for the next 1,000 years. The Bible will stay in Latin and no other Latin. And I should say this by way of reminder, as a book, uh, if, if, if you owned a book or if you had access to a book, it was because somebody had copied a copy uh, by hand. Uh, there is no book printed mechanically, typeset, any other mechanical printing for another 1,000 years. So books are handwritten and usually wrapped around a spool, uh, the way thread is wrapped around, uh, thread is wrapped around its own spool. Third, the church saved civilization by uh, providing great leadership from Rome. Uh, no longer the Roman emperor, but the Roman pontiff, or the Roman pope, or the bishop of Rome, or the vicar of Christ. And you have the great painting by Perugini, uh, to show you Christ giving the keys, the kingdom of heaven, uh, to St. Peter, uh, the first pope, uh, Gregory the Great, the greatest of the medieval popes. You, you have a picture of Gregory the Great in your thousand words folder, uh, a little bird perched on his shoulder, the Holy Spirit, uh, and go back and, and read that caption and, and look at that picture again for papal leadership. Fourth, the church had a clear theology or a clear body of writing about God, of the interpretation of God's word uh, in uh, Jerome's Bible. That's, that's called theology. Uh, the church had it. Uh, it's a necessary component to any religion that wants to be taken seriously over the long haul. And we owe St. Augustine uh, for church theology. So I, I would refer you back to Augustine uh, uh, particularly the sacraments, uh, and most particularly of the sacraments, uh, the sacrament of the Mass or the Eucharist or Communion with the supreme miracle there of transubstantiation, the bread changing to the body of Christ, the blood, the wine to the blood of Christ, uh, without any of that being uh, physically uh, apparent, uh, a miracle uh, of transubstantiation. Uh, Fifth, the church saved civilization uh, by a huge and widespread and very dangerous but very successful uh, wave of missionary uh, work. Uh, we just cleared St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick was the great missionary to the Irish. Uh, the patron saints of most European countries are the missionaries that brought Christianity to the pagan barbarians. Uh, our ancestors, the barbarian ancestors that we track directly from, the Anglo-Saxons or the Angles and the Saxons, uh, were typical of barbarians in that they recognized in what was left of the Roman Empire, in particular Roman Catholic Christianity, they recognized something there that was better uh, than themselves. And rather than destroy it, uh, they assimilated themselves uh, to it, uh, another way in which civilization can recover from the uh, terrible disaster of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and uh, go on. Uh, sixth, the church saved civilization through its monasteries. Uh, you, you've got good notes from the last class before the break about monasteries, what they are, uh, how they came to be, uh, and what those who lived in monasteries, monks, uh, did on behalf of saving civilization through lives of prayer, chastity, poverty, and uh, obedience. Uh, hard work in the fields, eating only what they lived, and particularly hard work in what were called the writing rooms, where these illiterate uh, men and some women 
uh, could not read a word of the ancient manuscripts that were collected there, but could copy uh, and in that way preserve uh, learning uh, for, uh, for posterity. Uh, we did not talk about the fact that in the uh, first century uh, after the birth of Christ, the great library at Alexandria was burned some kind of way. Lots of stories about who's responsible for that. But what went up in smoke uh, were, were all the manuscripts then in existence, nearly all the manuscripts then in existence from Egypt, from Mesopotamia, from ancient Greece, uh, from the Old Testament times uh, on into early, all into early Roman times, all gone, all up in smoke. Uh, but a remnant, an important remnant, saved uh, by the copying of the surviving manuscripts that went on in these monasteries. Uh, seventh, uh, the church saved civilization uh, by being a beacon. Uh, a beacon, again, is a, a discernible light in what is otherwise a sea of darkness. By being a beacon of hope, uh, as far as the second coming of Christ was concerned, it was hope that it would be soon, very soon, uh, and hope uh, for uh, the day uh, of judgment, uh, the day when uh, resurrection uh, comes. Uh, thanks to Christ, the teaching of the church went uh, to all of us. Uh, eighth, the church saved civilization by establishing an impressive physical presence uh, on the landscape, on the ground, uh, we would say. Uh, places of worship, churches were physically impressive, physically imposing places that commanded respect uh, and admiration. Uh, last class I gave you, uh, the church architecture came in two styles, uh, Romanesque, the early style, and Gothic, the later style. Uh, you've got a picture of a great Romanesque cathedral, the Mont Saint-Michel in France, and of Salisbury Cathedral uh, in England for the, for, the Gothic, uh, for the Gothic style. These great cathedrals, these great churches, uh, some of which were cathedrals. A cathedral is a bishop's church. Uh, but these great churches, cathedrals or otherwise, uh, were physically imposing, physically impressive uh, places of uh, worship uh, that play a huge role in keeping the light of civilization uh, alive. The church saved civilization, uh, number nine by my counting, the church saved civilization by taking over uh, the administrative network and many of the administrative procedures that were never any better of the uh, Roman Empire, uh, now gone. Uh, in replace of Roman officials, uh, you have uh, the bishops. Uh, the church is Episcopal in the sense that it is governed by bishops, uh, administered uh, by bishops, led, taught, and inspired uh, by bishops, uh, all of whom report, so to speak, uh, to the greatest of all the bishops, the Bishop of Rome, uh, the Pope uh, in uh, in Rome. Uh, the word bishop comes from the Greek word episcopus, uh, meaning shepherd, uh, and the bishops are the shepherds of their, of their flocks. Uh, and the whole pattern is a mirror image of what you would call a Roman uh, pyramid, uh, power pyramid. Ninth, the church existed as being, it saved civilization and furthered its existence by being uh, claiming to be and being legally sovereign, that is legally independent above and beyond the law of any earthly ruler, any king later on, any successive successor, uh, holy Roman emperor. Uh, their laws were worldly only. The laws of the church were based on spirit and were superior to above and beyond uh, any earthly uh, law. Uh, wherever it came from and whatever its claims uh, were. Tenth, the church saved civilization uh, by finding uh, for the first time in the early 800s, 
uh, by finding and keeping uh, important friends uh, in high places. And the first, by high places, I, I mean friends who were in a position to uh, defend the church, defend the church militarily, uh, protect missionaries, protect cathedrals, uh, uh, to be a defense force or a shield uh, behind which the church could do its work. Uh, the first such friends in high places uh, were the kings of the uh, one of the barbar one of the few uh, barbarian groups who came to stay, who came to put down roots like ours did. The Angles and the Saxons put down roots in what we call England. Uh, the Franks uh, put down roots in what the Romans called Gaul, what we call France from the Franks. Uh, Clovis. Uh, we disc I discussed Clovis in class uh, last time, was the first important uh, medieval ruler to embrace Roman Catholic Christianity. Uh, his uh, descendant, uh, Charlemagne, uh, Charles the Great, uh, 769 to 814, uh, was the greatest uh, uh, of all of the kings of the Franks. And he was, an, uh, he, he was a, special, uh, a, a, a special friend in a high place of the church. And I described how that came to be uh, uh, capping, concluding, capping the whole long association off was what happened on Christmas morning in the old St. Peter's in Rome uh, when Charlemagne had come down from uh, Gaul, come down from uh, the Frankish kingdom uh, to take mass uh, Christmas morning uh, as it would be administered uh, by the uh, bishop, uh, the bishop of Rome. Uh, the Mass was the supreme miracle in Catholic uh, theology, is the supreme miracle in Catholic uh, theology. And to take Mass, the bread and the wine, from the bishop of Rome himself uh, was a uh, spectacular uh, blessing. And Charlemagne came uh, to Rome that Christmas morning, knelt before the altar. Uh, whether or not he understood what was about to happen or not is unclear, uh, but before administering, before uh, proffering the bread and the wine, uh, the Pope placed a crown on Charlemagne's head and made him a holy Roman emperor, uh, the Christian successor, in other words, uh, to the old pagan uh, emperors uh, who uh, would serve the church as its shield and as its defender in the way Constantine uh, had done in the uh, in the fourth in the fourth century. Charlemagne uh, was very much involved in the eleventh way in which the church saved uh, civilization. That was uh, in bringing about a revival of learning a very modest revival and of faith-based learning only, uh, nothing on the scale of uh, ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia or Greece or Rome, but you have to begin, you have to recover learning somewhere. Uh, in your handout last time, you have a section on what's called the Carolingian Renaissance, Carolingian meaning anything really happening under Charlemagne and Renaissance uh, meaning rebirth, in this case, the rebirth of learning. In this particular case, the rebirth of faith-based uh, learning. Uh, it happened uh, at Charlemagne's uh, behest in his capital city at Aachen uh, in today's uh, Germany. Uh, it was a modest beginning Charlemagne himself did not know how to read or write. He understood its 